Alright, in this video we're going to go over the disassembly of the Ruger 1022. This model was introduced in 1964 and there have been over 4 million factory 1022s made since then. Uh, there's all kinds of different variations, both from Ruger and aftermarket companies. This one is completely original. It's got the Ruger factory yellow-gray laminate stock, stainless finish, even the scope rail came from Ruger. Uh, there's so many different aftermarket companies that you can actually make an entire 1022 design rifle without using any factory Ruger parts, including the receiver. Uh, there's companies that make everything for it and you can build one up from scratch. The only uh, firearm designs I know of that you can do that with are 1911, AR-15s, AK series, and 1022s. However, even though there's over 4 million of them out there, they're not the most popular 1022 in history. Uh, Marlin claims to have sold over 11 million Marlin 60s and its variations uh, 1960, so it had a four-year uh, head start, but in the past 10-15 years, Rugers have been increasingly dominating market share. Uh, there's a couple reasons for this. 1022, 10 actually comes from the 10-round capacity. Uh, most firearms back in the time of the design either had a two-pit magazine running underneath the barrel, so you could get a dozen plus rounds, or you'd get a single box magazine that would stick out below the receiver. Ruger came out with their patented uh, magazine design, so it actually fits flush with the stock, gives it a nice clean look, and uh, you can hold 10 rounds. A lot of people try to claim that the Ruger 1022 was designed off of the uh, M1 carbine. That's not completely true. The Ruger 1022 was designed off the Ruger 44 carbine. Uh, the 44 was introduced three years prior in 1961, uh, but both have a general style of the M1 carbine. Here's an actual 22 style after the M1 carbine. This one's a West German Irma EM1 HBA. Uh, notice they have very similar dimensions, similar stocks, similar trigger and safety assemblies, uh, the barrel band locations, the barrel lengths are almost exactly the same, and the charging handle is styled similar. However, Ruger ditched a couple things. They went without the GI sights and they did their own thing so it was a little more precise, mounting the sights on the barrel, having a uh, single dot on the front that also allows you to mount things on the uh, top of the receiver with scope rails. Uh, but that was just for the purposes of functionality, whereas this West German carving actually retains all of the visual and most of the functionality features of the original M1 carving. Uh, in my experience, actually, the Irma functions better than uh, my 1022s do. I've never had a problem with this. Uh, all my weapons very well maintained and clean, but I've had plenty of problems with Ruger's. Uh, never had a functions problem with the, uh, the Irma series, so whatever the, the Ruger did to change the design, never heard anything on this one. Still got the original Ruger scope. Uh, here part on top where you can mount a, a scope to the receiver and it's got a, a magazine that's styled a lot more like the original M1 carving. Uh, Irma's actually make quality 22 in various authentic forms. In fact, here's a Irma KGP 69 in 22 long rifle. Uh, at first glance it looks exactly like a P08 Luger. It even has the infamous toggle bolt link mechanism. Uh, this one's blowback of course. But uh, Irma was actually the original 22 caliber conversion uh, for the centerfire Lugers. You just replace the barrel slide and rest of the in, uh, internal action, and you could put a 22 conversion kit on a centerfire Luger. And uh, these function better than the modern Stoger 22 Lugers, in my opinion. Uh, again, in my experience, so your results may vary. All right, enough of the history. Let's get back to the actual teardown of the Ruger 1022. First thing we do in handling a farm is, of course, check to make sure the weapon's unloaded. So we're going to go ahead and push this button right here. That'll allow the magazine to drop right out the bottom. We'll go ahead and take it out. We can see if the magazine's empty. Set that aside. We're going to go ahead and pull the bolt to the rear. Look into the chamber. We can see if the weapon's unloaded. We can go ahead and begin disassembling it. All right. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the safety is actually located halfway between safe and fire. This is one of the more interesting things with the Ruger design. If you put the safety uh, little pin here on one side or the other, you'll actually end up screwing up your stock as you pull it out. That knob will actually dent or ding the stock on either side. So you've got to have the weapon halfway between safe and fire, and that way you can pull it out. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to go to the main action takedown screw right here in front of the magazine. I've already loosened the screw for time purposes. We're going to go ahead and loosen the screw, pull it out just a little bit. It'll retain itself in the stock because of the size of the threads. And we can go ahead and then go to the front of the rifle. We're going to go ahead and remove the screw here. I've already taken it out and slide the barrel band right off the front of the rifle. Uh, for those of you who have Rugers that don't have that feature, 
a lot of factory Rugers with different variations or aftermarket models will have stocks that actually don't have any barrel band on the front. Uh, this is a Ruger Classic 1 Talo uh, oak leaf and as you can see it's got the schnabel front end, a thin profile stock. The only thing holding the stock to the receiver is just the same old uh, main takedown screw in front of the magazine so you don't have to worry about the barrel band there. So once you've removed the barrel band and the action screw from the stock, we can go ahead and take this. We're going to set the rifle upside down on the receiver. We're just going to very carefully lift the stock off of the barreled action. And then set that aside up here. We've got our screwdriver. Now, the next thing we're going to do to remove the trigger assembly from the receiver, we're going to need to take out some of the cross pins. Uh, the factory Ruger design uses a lot of pins here in the receiver to hold pieces into the stock and the receiver. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take out the little pin here at the very back, the lower smaller one, set that aside. We're going to go ahead and take out the smaller pin in the front. And now once you have these two pins out, we're going to set that to the side and we can now take the trigger assembly out of the stock, uh, the receiver. Now there shouldn't be a lot you'd have to do with this. Uh, for those of you who are trying to customize your 1022, make it shoot a little better, lighten the trigger, whatever it is you want to do, uh, you can get a lot of parts replaced in here. There's a lot of aftermarket companies for various triggers. A lot of it's pretty drop-in. Again, you can see that the trigger group has some more uh, cross pins in here that you can push out and replace parts on your trigger, your hammer, etc. if you want to get into all that silliness. As for cleaning, there shouldn't be a lot of cleaning you should have to do. There may be a little gunpowder getting kicked back into the action from uh, the bolt and the receiver. Uh, just take a little Q-tip or whatever it is you use to clean, wipe up around in that area. But uh, unless you're confident in what you're doing or you're trying to replace parts, don't take anything out of the uh, trigger assembly. Go ahead and set that aside for now. Now the next thing we're going to do is we want to take the bolt out of the receiver. But before we can take the bolt out, if you see we push back, it actually stops. That's because of this main cross pin here. That's the recoil buffer. A lot of people will actually take the factory buffer and replace it with uh, little rubber parts that take a little bit of a recoil a little better than the factory metal piece. But all you need to do is just take whatever it is you're using, push out the little pin here, and remove that from the back of the receiver. Here we go. I've got the pin out. We'll go ahead and take the pin aside. And now we've got enough room in here in the back of the receiver that we can push the bolt back and lift it out. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and set the receiver down on the table. We're going to go ahead and take the charging handle with our thumb here, push it all the way back. And once we get back to the point where the bolt clears the little uh, rail on the inside of the receiver, we're just going to lift it straight off. Let the charging handle and the recoil spring guide push it forward, and you can take the bolt down. Now again, for the bolt, there shouldn't be a lot to clean in here. You may need to clean up around the charging handle area. You want to clean on the uh, the bolt face where it retains the uh, the cartridge. The extractor groove here, just push that back. You may want to clean out a little bit of grime from there to make sure that your, uh, your extractor is not pulling uh, or getting dragged on while you're trying to uh, recover the cartridges from the barrel chamber. And other than that, that should be all you'd have to do for the uh, bolt. You shouldn't need to take anything apart in here, uh, once again, unless you're trying to replace parts or you're exceedingly confident in whatever modifications you're trying to do. Go ahead and set this aside for now. Now once we've got that, we can just easily lift the charging handle, the recoil spring, and the recoil spring guide right out of the receiver. It compresses here and that's what's used to give the force for the blowback action to push the bolt back forward. Set that aside, that's usually not too dirty. Alrighty, sorry about that, my camera decided to die out at that moment. So like I was saying, you just want to clean up on the inside of the bare receiver. As you can see here, it's still got a little bit of grime in it from uh, last time I was out shooting. Just go ahead and take whatever it is you use to clean up. When you want to lube the inside of this and on the, the bolt so that it slides nice and freely, either use dry graphite or d go real lightly on the oil so that you don't get a lot of buildup. One of the places you want to make sure you clean is on the front here where the uh, barrel facing is clean around that and make sure you clean in the little cut out there for the extractor roof where it grips and pulls the uh, case out of the chamber. Uh, you're probably not going to want to take off the barrel. There's no reason to for just regular cleaning. If for some reason you decide you want to, there's uh, two hex head screws on the front of this V-block. You take that off. This little plastic piece here is what holds the barrel. You see it's got a special cut out there. Uh, it's one of the designs Ruger uses to kind of force the barrel in to the receiver and keep it in nice and tight. Uh, if you're replacing the barrel with an aftermarket piece, uh, the aftermarket company will A, give you really good instructions on how to replace it, or B, tell you to go to a gunsmith. So for our purposes here, there's no reason to take the barrel out of the receiver. 
and that is the disassembly of the Ruger 1022.